Hi guys, it's Beth. Thank you as always for joining me this week on Remorselessly Biblical. Okay, we are interviewing and spending time with Mrs. International, Priscilla Pruitt. I met Priscilla who is, you know, you can't be Mrs. International and not just be this incredible force of nature on the outside and the inside. Priscilla is beautiful, but her heart is what is the most beautiful thing I think I've ever seen. She talks about how she was moved to go out into the world and save the lives of babies, babies who are abandoned, babies who come into the world and and just left on the side of the road as an example. So she really shares about her mission with Safe Haven Baby Boxes on this episode. You are not going to want to miss this. And just really, if I can encourage you through this conversation with Priscilla to pay attention to how she talks about faith over fear. I know that's an overused term. She had so much fear, really unknown, uncertainty with doing this thing. And this thing is being Mrs. International and being part of Safe Haven Baby Boxes and having six children and moving from a giant population in Texas to a very tiny town in Wyoming. It's all scary, but she doesn't really seem afraid in in her decision-making on her journey. In fact, she seems resolute in it because she has so much faith in God. This woman, you guys, is incredible. So as always, I am very grateful to spend this time with you every week on the show on Remorselessly Biblical. Remorseless reminder means without guilt, in spite of wrongdoing, never let doing things wrong stop you from doing the next right thing. We've all done wrong in our lives. We've all made wrong choices wrong turns, gotten off of our paths, but that is not at all something that God can't work out for his good, right? Romans 8, 28, we know it. He works all things out for his good, for our good, right? So we're not a little mistake that we made, or even a big mistake, not going to detour, detour, detract, not going to stop God. (laughs) God is literally unstoppable. This is who he is. God's character, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. God is all things, all times, always. We are made in his image. We just have to trust and step out in faith and say, I might be afraid of this next thing in my life, but I have faith that God has been preparing me for a time such as this. So will you guys please do me the honor of welcoming Priscilla Pruitt to the show. So Priscilla, thank you so much for joining us this week on Remorselessly Biblical. I love that I get to see you again. I know, me too. <laughs> no, I'm so happy we're together. And so one of the things that I always start out with sharing with our viewers and listeners is how I know the person that I'm spending time with because I'm a big believer in God's providence. And sometimes I have people on the show that I've known forever. Sometimes I have people that I've never met. And so can you just share with people like how we cross paths? Yeah, so we were both at the National Religious Broadcasters event uh, this last, what was it, June? Um, And so it's been a couple months now, but we just kind of were sitting next to each other and we started talking and um, I started talking about what I do with the homeless out here in Colorado. And he told me a little bit what you were doing. And I was like, we have to connect. And so, you know, we just hit it off and we kept running into each other the whole week. And the rest was just history. We stayed in touch and here we are. I know. I love that story so much. I remember we were sitting, I think it was Dennis Quaid who was speaking in that evening. It was just a beautiful event. Yes. So will you tell everybody just a little bit about who you are, how you came to be at NRB, how you came to be affiliated with the homeless folks in your community? Just just whatever was on, is on your heart to share to the folks out there today who are watching. Well, I'm first and foremost, a follower of Christ. I always call myself a Jesus freak because that's probably one of my favorite songs. I still love it. Still to this day, my kids are like, don't put on Jesus freak. Mom starts head banging. So <laughs> warning. <laughs> love it. Um, but I'm a mother. I have six kids. I am a wife. I've been married for almost 20 years now, which is kind of crazy when I think about it. I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm getting up there with age and stuff. But you know, 
I'm like so grateful. I've done so many great things in my life. God has brought me on this amazing, powerful talk show called God's View. He opened up doors for me to do that through winning the crown of Mrs. International, which God opened doors for that as well, um, to pursue all these great things that I always dreamed of, baby boxes, um, was something I never thought I would do in my lifetime. And God opened doors for me to do that. And so I'm on the board of director. My husband's on the board of director and we both work with safe haven baby boxes. And then we just started this ministry at our church called the love army. And through the love army, we're helping the homeless out here. We're doing evangelism, street evangelism, all different types of things, but it's really about being the hands and feet of Christ. Mm -hmm. And, you know, love is what conquers all. There's nothing more powerful than love because God is love. So um, it's amazing what we're doing with the Love Army. But it truly is nothing that I've done or I've done to deserve it. It's all God. I have no idea how I got here because I was not a perfect human growing up. I've had ups and downs and I've had to learn things the hard way. And God just uses all of that mess and he turns it into a message. And God has just used our message. And my message has just been simple. It's choose love. Mm. And so as Mrs. International, I always taught my following. I use that platform to say, choose love. And in choosing love, you're choosing God because God is love. So. <laughs> and what just popped in my head is I could not love that more, but I don't want to sound like we're talking like, oh, she said love. I'm saying love, but it is envelop. Like that's the word that comes to mind. You just exude this literally envelopment of love all around you with whatever you're pursuing and whatever you're doing. Yeah. And I don't know anything about Mrs. Inter Will you tell us about Mrs. Inter International? Like when was that? Where was that? How was that? I know nothing about this. I played basketball, Priscilla. I don't know this role. Um, so it's kind of a funny story because I never really saw myself entering a pageant. I was actually very bullied growing up. I was very hairy and I looked different being very Latin and Cuban. And so I kind of had like this unibrow and I had a little, you know, a little hair on my lip and they used to call me Harry and the Hendersons. And so I was really bullied. And I remember running home at nine years old and crying because they were calling me Harry and the Henderson because my legs were hairier than normal girls. And so I started shaving at the age of nine. And so I never expected to be a beauty queen one day. I remember as a little girl, I would always have people come up to me and say that you're an Esther. And it was the most common prophecy. People would just randomly come over to me and say, do you realize that you're an Esther and you have an Esther anointing? And so it almost started to get a little bit annoying to me because I was like, God, what are you saying with this? And so my husband and I, we had moved from Texas, population 2.5 million. And we moved to this small town in Newcastle, Wyoming, population 3,500 with all six kids. Wow. And... um. It was just a huge culture shock, but God called us there. And we found out later that it was because it was the number one County for suicides in the U S and so God really used that. And during that time, we started this outreach with youth. We would feed them every week and do all these fun things. We'd have obstacle courses. We'd have movies in the park and all these things. And I really was trying very, very difficult by myself and my husband. And I were trying really hard to get this rec center started in a small town. And I kept thinking, God, what am I doing wrong? What should I do? And I felt the Lord speaking to me through this vision he gave me. And it was me on a stage becoming a beauty queen. And I felt him tell me that it was time for me to walk in my Esther anointing. And so I started looking up pageants and all this stuff. And I was really trying to help my daughter. She was trying to figure out what to do. And when I was looking something up, it just popped up, Mrs. Wyoming, America. And I was like, what? and missus being married women so I was like wow God is this what you're speaking to me and I felt this overcoming peace just tell me that this was for me and so it was 30 days out I had just broken my nose four months earlier because when we moved to Wyoming my two oldest girls had given up all their dance they were in drill team they were in cheerleading and so of course having this small town with nothing for kids to do I started a cheer team and I had to become the coach voluntarily for the high school. And so during that, I was teaching this stunt where you pick up a girl and she has to flip down, but she wasn't tucking her neck. And so I dove in as the coach to go save her because I thought she's going to be paralyzed. And in that process, because I'm watching her, 
she kicked me oh. right here. My nose escaped out of the bridge of my nose up here. So the bone of my nose escaped out. Had it gone into my brain, I would have been dead instantly. And so my nose was over here. And I just remember waking up and there was nothing here. And I go over here and there's my nose. Oh my goodness. Oh, I know. Crazy. It was really gross. But I had to have my nose completely reconstructed and it's fake bone, but it didn't fully cure. It took, I was four months out and it takes at least six months to fully cure. My face was still kind of chunky from the swelling and I had black eyes for nine weeks. So it was a huge, big deal. And so entering this pageant would totally be faith. And it would have to take a lot of faith on my part to enter not being ready because these girls, they prepare for months like Esther did in the Bible. She prepared for a year, I believe, or longer. And these girls, they worked out to prepare. And I hadn't done anything. And I was 30 days out. When I so you don't enter a pageant 30 days going on. So. Um, so I took faith and I won. And what I didn't realize is when you win that, you got to go on to the next step, which means then I have to go represent Wyoming at Mrs. America. And so I go to Mrs. America and um, I really sought God. I remember getting on my face and saying, God, I feel inadequate. I don't feel worthy. I don't feel skinny enough. I don't feel all these things. And God just gave me this peace. And he was like, just trust me, just be yourself, just speak truth, speak life. And so my platform really at the time was what we were doing. It was working with the youth against suicide, working, you know, against depression. And, you know, I really worked about or talked about, about um, investing in your future generations. And I ended up winning first runner up. And that's a good, that's a good win for Wyoming being such right. a small state. We're like the underdog state. Right. And so um, I remember asking God, like, why would you allow me to get first runner up if you called me to this? And he gently, so beautifully reminded me that he didn't tell me which pageant system to enter, that I chose that one. And I was like, well, what does that mean? Well, it turns out there's like Mrs. Wyoming America, there's Mrs. Wyoming USA, there's Mrs. Wyoming International, and there's all these systems. And I was like, well, why does it matter? Well, it actually really did matter. And so um, Mrs. America was owned by a Jewish man, good man, but he was Jewish, and he had a problem with the name of Jesus. And I'm going to say the name of Jesus all the time, especially if I'm a winner, I'm going to make sure that he gets all the glory. In fact, when I won, it was like the most beautiful praise and worship to God on stage <laughs> because it was all about him, not me. Yeah. And so um, I kept having these dreams and my husband even kept having these dreams of me winning. And so I remember going to a church because there was going to be a speaker and he had a word for me and he brought me up and everyone's still there. And this is at the end, he goes, and God says, you're going to win. And I was like, oh my gosh, is that what I think it means? And so I remember asking him afterwards, I was like, why did you say that? What does that mean to you? He said, I don't know. God told me it, and I said it. And I was like, okay. So I started asking the Lord, why Mrs. International? Is this what you're asking? Is it this pageant or is it this one? And I just kept saying, would come up and be like, have you ever heard of the Mrs. International system? I think you'd be a great fit and all this stuff. And so finally I asked God and I thought him about the silver and I entered. And I end up winning. So it was a huge journey. I'm telling you everything went wrong in that pageant. God kept reminding me that it wasn't about me. My foot was stuck in the tooling of my dress. I tripped in the opening number. I had someone do my makeup. It was awful. But it was never about me. It was God showing me that it was me. It was God inside of me that allowed me to win. And that he anointed me for that position because everything went wrong. Yeah. And so um, it was incredible. But I, I, I honestly didn't know at the time why I had to be Mrs. International until later on. When I won, I realized that I had to write three blogs a week. There was a contract that you had to do two video blogs. And during that time, I would pray and ask the Lord what he would have me say. And I used every one of those blogs and blogs to talk about God. They were basically sermons. And I realized why God had to do Mrs. International. Because if I had been Mrs. America, 
I would have had the freedom to say Jesus. But as Mrs. International, the, the owners were Christian. I had the freedom to talk about Jesus as much as I wanted. And so in everything that happened in my life, I can see that. I can look back and go, wow, I said early as 2020. God was protecting me. He was using me. He was walking alongside me all along. And it was his grace that gave me first runner up. Wow. It was amazing. <laughs> Wow. 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 What a testament, right? Because I hope what everybody is hearing right now is how you stepped out in incredible faith and you had this word, you had this prophetic sort of feel, intuition. And the thing is, everybody calls it something different, right? People are like, oh, it's the Holy spirit within me or, oh, it's my gut instinct or, oh, whatever it is, it's God. Literally we, he knows our beginnings, our middles, our ends. He's the author of our entire story. And, and you had the wherewithal to say, I have no idea, but I'm going to do this thing. And I love the part, especially where you say like everything went wrong. Like my foot got caught in the tooling. I'm falling down. I'm this bumbling mat. Like my nose is broken. My, and I'm still doing it because I just know I'm supposed to do it. Exactly. That's the best thing. And, and, and that God directed you through all of that that experience, collective experience, right? Like from the fact you're like, I don't even know what this is. What do you mean? Okay. And you're doing, you're living life as you, you're doing your work with your daughters and you're just, you're just living life. He's directing you and you're listening and you're being an obedient servant and you're doing all of these things and, and his word, right? His messaging, he's using you as the person to deliver that. And I think so, so many times we don't know how we're supposed to be used but it's if we just continue to move forward and trust and just know like, okay, however God wants to be seen, to be heard, to be known, we're just the vessels for that, you know? Right. And yeah. And so many people just give up before they even walk onto a stage or they grab a microphone or they make a decision. It doesn't have to be even some grandiose gesture. It just has to be some faith-based, okay, I will do this next thing and believe that it's going to lead me because we're always being prepared. Mm -hmm. That's my thing. I always say, you just have to have more faith than you do fear. Like if you're afraid, that's okay. Cause it's going to take faith. You can't see it. Just do it afraid. Do it afraid. And God will like part the sea. And you know, I can't imagine not having stepped out in faith because I would have missed out so many opportunities. I wouldn't have met you because I wouldn't have gone in our faith. The reason I went to NRB is because as Mrs. National, God opened doors for me to become the co-host on God's View. Mm -hmm. I would have missed out on working with Safe Haven Baby Boxes, which is my dream job. That was something that I remember watching uh, the Dropbox. It's a documentary about Dr. Lee, uh, Pastor Lee in Korea, and how he, you know, found this baby in a dumpster. He heard a baby crying. He went over there, got the baby, took it in, raised it started putting these cardboard boxes saying, please don't dump your babies, leave your baby here. And he would make these walks and rounds and collect these babies and raise them as his own. And I remember watching that and having tears in my eyes and praying, God, please let me be a part of this. I have to do do something and be a part of this. And Mrs. International opened doors for me to do baby boxes and to be on the board of directors and be helping and saving babies all over the world. And I was able to write my children's book and I'm about to release my second children's book. And that was all because I stepped out in faith and I didn't allow my fear to stop my faith. But in faith, I did it afraid and God used it. Yes, yes. And you asked him very specifically, like you knew this, when you saw that documentary, it made an impression on your heart and you talked to God about it and there it is, you know? And so I think so many times people will read scripture and not necessarily fully believe and it's like, yes, ask, knock, ye shall receive, right? And so, so and then, yeah, yeah. And Romans, right, 828, we know he does truly work all things for his good. So at the end of the day, he's providing you your dream. He's filling your heart with joy. You're doing the things that you love, but it's for his glory. Mm-hmm. And it's like this win-win reciprocity. And so many people get hung up on like, what am I supposed to do? What am I called to do? And it's like, that's already inside of us. We just have to talk to God and say, right. show, show me your way and trust. And, and I think what the fear comes from, we need to know how much we actually do trust. You know, it's not about us. Like we're not leading this charge by any stretch. So thank you for sharing that. It's amazing. Will you tell us also to Priscilla about a little more about um, safe haven baby boxes, what your role is with that, how we can help, like what it actually is. Yeah. 
Well, I don't know if you realize, but there are 10 different states right now that allow late abortions. And so, um, you know, right now, there's there really is a battle for life or death right now going on. And the cool thing is that this is going out before the 40 days for life, which actually starts on September 22nd. So I wanted to plug that in that on September 22nd, we're asking people to go to abortion clinics and peacefully and silently just pray, just pray. And when you do that, they say that 75% of their abortion appointments don't show up. And ever since they started doing this 40 days for life and the name, I mean, the number 40 is very symbolic in the word. Right. And so 40 is for a reason. But when they do that, since they started doing this, they've had over 100 abortion clinics shut down, over 300 workers quit and over 18,000 babies saved. So this works. And so safe pain baby boxes, you know, we, we are Christian owned. The founder is a Christian and she actually was concealed, conceived at a rape. Her mother concealed her pregnancy, and then she actually abandoned her outside of a hospital in a box. And she was doing what she could to try to save her baby. Fortunately, she was found, fortunately for her. A lot of babies, though, when they're found, by the time that they're found, they're frozen to death. So I definitely don't want to condone that. So what we came up with is these boxes, and it's uh, it goes back to Pastor Lee, what he was doing in Korea. These boxes are actually put into the exterior wall, like they're installed into the exterior wall of a fire station, a police station, or a hospital. And if a mother is, you know, found, in, found herself in crisis and she doesn't want to, maybe we go through this list of things like, we're like, you know, we try to help her not choose. We're like, this is our last resort option. So we're like, we try to give her a parenting plan, help her find resources that she needs. If she's like, no, I don't want to keep the baby. Then we try to, aim, you know, aim for uh, adoption and find her an adoption agency that we know we trust. And if she's like, I don't want to do that either. Then we send her to either fire station, a police station or hospital, because all 50 states have safe haven laws that allow you to surrender your baby. And we try to help her find one. But if she's like, I don't want someone to see me. We came up with this for the moms that are maybe they're from a small town, like I would lived in Newcastle, Wyoming, and they're too afraid to be recognized. Because mm -hmm. if you go to a hospital, a fire station, or police station in that small town, everyone knows everyone. Yeah. And so you're going to, someone's going to hear from the grapevine and they're going to recognize you and know. And so there's a lot of shame attached to this. What we provide is no shame, no blame, and no name. You don't have to give a name. No one sees your face. You, in, you place the baby inside of the baby box, which opens up from the exterior wall. There's no cameras. There's nothing. It's in an area completely um, isolated from the main entrance. And when you place the baby inside, there is an immediate detector that comes off. It alarms the EMT. And so in 30 seconds, they know that there's been a baby placed in there. It's equipped with heating, with cooling. It has good ventilation. And once that door is closed, no one from the outside can open and steal the baby. So it locks so that the baby will not be kidnapped. And then it opens up from the inside of the building where the EMT pick up the baby within two to three minutes. And that baby is then placed in a forever home. I'm almost <laughs> at this entire process. This is amazing. You are saving lives. Literally, we this, are. this saves lives. What an incredible- It does. Um, the numbers are, let me see if I can find our, our current numbers because it, they try to update them all the time. But the numbers speak for themselves. You know, we have, we have 77 baby boxes across five states, Kentucky, Arkansas, Ohio, Indiana, and Florida. We are only a few years old. And um, I know that we've had 11 babies, maybe 12 now, um, saved at the boxes, but we've helped over 80,000 mothers. So because we have a hotline. Yeah. And so like we said, we try to use the boxes as our last resort option. So we really do. And when I say we help these mothers, like we are the real deal. Our founder, when someone called in and it was a mother, she was like, I need help. And she begged our founder to foster her daughter and our founder fostered her daughter for 18 months until she could get clean and get the rehabilitation she needed. And now she sees her, she still sees her. She has visitation with her and they're in great communication, but the mother is clean and she's been a good mom and we helped her. So it, that's the kind of stuff that we do. Like we really walk the walk. It's not just talk for us. We love these children. We love these mothers, the mothers that have chosen the boxes. We stay in contact with them 
because they wanted to, not because we asked them to. They've messaged us after the fact and said, hey, I was the one that left the baby. I just want to make sure the baby's okay. And we say, hey, the baby is safe. They're happy with the family. We keep in touch with them only if they want to. But yeah. that's a testimony in itself. Like It's not about judging these mothers. It's not about criticizing them or condemning them. It's about loving them. Yes, that's it. And that's what you started this with is that it's love. God is love. You are out there demonstrating God's compassion. You're doing Micah 6, 8, and you are absolutely just showering love upon everybody who comes into your path. And you're letting people know, Hey, this is a safe place. You're not here to be condemned. You're here yeah. and we will show you love. We are going to demonstrate the compassion and love that Jesus shows us all. So Wow. 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 Where can we find you? Where can our viewers and listeners find you from here? Well, if you want to go on my website, it's because yep. I choose love.org. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> or you can go to safehavenbabyboxes.com. Okay. Um, or you can go to our church and we have the love army there. And that is citypointchurch.com. Thank you so much, Priscilla. And I will include all of this in our show notes for our listeners and our viewers. And I, you know, it's not often people that know me, um, will believe that I'm out of words, but the more that I get to know you and the more that I hear your heart and your journey, I just, um, very grateful. I'm just grateful for the person that you are and for the way that you show up in the world and the way that you give back and just encourage people to say, you know what? I don't really know. I have this dream. I have this, this inkling. I know I should be doing something. I feel it and I might be afraid, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I love it. Thank you for all of your work for the kingdom. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes. Okay. Talk to you soon. Look at me. Don't have words, you guys. Bay Paven Baby Boxes. Incredible mission. Incredible lives saved. Number of lives saved. I hope you really enjoyed this discussion that Priscilla put forth with us. She is just an amazing human. And so are you, right? We all have mattering and value and worth and a calling on our lives that God has placed. So when you take time to say, I just heard a message. I just saw a person. I just read a book. I just had a feeling and it moves you. Talk to God about that. That's exactly what Priscilla did, you guys. And she said that. And she's like, I watched this documentary. I knew that I was called to do this work. And she talked to God and here she is. She's part of Safe Haven Baby Boxes. Every single step on our journey is weaving together this beautiful tapestry of a picture that is unfinished until God's finished with us. So you guys don't give up. Keep showing up every day. Be exactly who he created you to be. Be remorseless on your journeys. And if I can help in any way, reach out to me. I'm at bethfisher.com. I'm happy to coach you. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm happy to talk to you about Here's a book, here's a resource, here's life. Here we are, brothers and sisters in Christ. So you guys, as always, thank you for joining me each and every week on Remorselessly Biblical, and I will see you next week.